a reading from Acts chapter 13, verses 13 to 52. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness, and he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Saviour, Jesus, as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you're looking for, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the, forg the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe even if someone told you. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who taught with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, 
we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's quite a dramatic uh, bit of scripture. And you've got to remember that that was actually uh, part of Paul's sermon. This is the first sermon that we actually see or hear or read Paul preach. So if you want uh, a a quiz question for the future, what was the first sermon uh, recorded preached by Paul? There it is, um, right there and then. Now, today I've called this, uh, this sermon today two words. It's about Jesus. Okay, we've um, been working our way through Acts. It's been at least three weeks since I preached uh, here. And, um, but the message of Jesus, what he has done and what he has accomplished has been the message of all eternity. From the moment of the fall of man, God forecasted that this king... Jesus would come. And that message has gone out and many of us who are here today have heard this message and embraced who Jesus Christ is as evidenced by those who have shared in bread and wine at the table today. And that message, that precious message of the good news of Jesus is right now being taken to the very ends of the earth by faithful people who are going into lands where their lives are under threat, by people like Ian and Andrea who are finding ways via the internet to get programs into people's phones and uh, other devices so they can hear the good news about Jesus. If our message is not about Jesus, then we do not carry life-giving word to the world around us. And it's this specific message that we need to bring. That Jesus has risen from the dead and he is who uh, those around him said he was. He is who scripture um, prophesied that he would be, the Messiah, uh, God's anointed one. And as a result, the message about Jesus, because he is who was promised to be, the message of God, the message about Jesus, has spread like wildfire across planet Earth. From 2,000 years ago, this message has emerged from a small, insignificant state, so that many of the nations of the whole world now understand what the good news of Jesus Christ is. Little known fact amongst Christians is that there are more Christians alive today than have ever lived on planet Earth added together. That is incredible. More people claim in the name of Jesus Christ as Lord. So, last time I preached from Acts 13 verses 1 to 12, there's been a long pause And uh, we've done the first 12 verses. And um, it's interesting that um, when the Apostle Paul and his his partner in good news preaching messages, Barnabas, they launched out uh, from a city in Syria, Antioch, and they launched, that was the title of the message three weeks ago, they launched with a specific mission in mind. And that was to take a boat, um, to go um, 
to an island known as Cyprus and begin to preach about Jesus there and then to, to do what most people who take a cruise like to do. I'm not looking at anyone in, in particular. But to do a bit of island hopping and to go around. But they, their island hopping was not so they could go and see these places and do a bit of sightseeing. It was so they could share the good news about Jesus. The first stage was obviously to, to get to... Uh, um, where were we at the beginning? To Cyprus. And we, we read there, more or less, it was about the who's they preached to, who they spoke to. But today is more exciting, in my opinion, than who it was being preached to. It was what they preached, who they preached about. And so uh, we get our teeth into this. Um, before we look um, at the rest of the message, I want to just uh, catch the setting. And it, uh, it sets, this sets the scene for us. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sail to Perga in Pamphylia. Anyone know which country that's in today? Perga? Someone said Turkey. Yeah, yeah well done. It was the reader of the passage who must have done his research. Excellent. They were in Turkey. And they went on to Pisidian Antioch. And on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. This is the setting. Could you imagine that you turned up at a church uh, in a land where you weren't too familiar with the people and, uh, and they decided to read the scripture and then just to throw it out there and uh, say, oh, well, um, perhaps you could say a few words. Has anyone ever done that? I had to do that in Thailand. I can't believe it. Somebody else had already preached and they mentioned another scripture and the, and the pastor was sitting next to me. He says, oh, oh Pastor Collins now going to come and share some words. <laughs> and I said, I, um, my tie is, not, is a bit rusty. <laughs> he said, don't worry, I'll translate. So I kept it short for him. It's at this point, I'm not sure if anyone has ever written, noticed this before, but... Uh, it's right here at this point, in, uh, in this tabernacle where they were meeting, suddenly you find that uh, Paul takes the lead. Up until this point, do your homework, you will notice uh, Barnabas and Saul was the order of the names. Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. Then we get here and suddenly it becomes Paul and his companions. Paul takes the lead on this mission team, on this mission trip. Um, and so Paul has now effectively become the leader. And he enters the city of Antioch of Pisidia, or Pisidian Antioch, it's just describing the region. And as is his normal custom, enters the synagogue and he goes in there and sits down. Well, you're all now in the position where Paul was until the leader of the synagogue decided that the person sitting down is the person who's going to be doing the speaking. Interesting, isn't it, eh? Can you imagine the pressure? Just like many of us, we come into church and we sit down. On a Sunday, Paul goes in and sits down. Now their service had all the elements that it would normally have had, which were quite universal for the day, and they would no doubt have uh, um, sung the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. From uh, Deuteronomy, anyone tell me? Chapter 6 and verse 4. Note it down. You can put it to a tune. You can sing it. Uh, of course, they would have... Um, there's the words. They would have sung it in Hebrew, of course. Um, we're not going to do that. And then there would have been a reading from the law and from the prophets. And 
Normally the custom was that someone would give a sermon or an exegesis based upon the text. Well, the two visitors who were there that day, one of them being Paul, had uh, been brought up under the tutelage of one of the most famous uh, scholars, Jewish teachers of their day, Gamaliel. And so they knew this. I mean, if you had a famous preacher or the son of a famous preacher turn up in church and the, they were just going to sit down, most people would probably think, let's get them to do it. Because they will probably do a far better job. And so uh, Paul takes the opportunity. Could you imagine uh, if I'd have said, um, oh, Paul, would you like to say a few words? And he'd go, nah. Well, if I was to come and sit down with you today and, uh, and just turn to you and say, would, um, would you mind telling me a bit about Jesus? Why do you love him so much? Would you be able to give me at least a minute on why Jesus is worthy of being worshipped? Well, Paul, of course he did. He didn't say no. He took an opportunity to present Jesus. He sees the opportunity. And uh, he sees the opportunity to speak. And I love how it begins. Standing up. Um, it was almost as though... Uh, uh, free man. Stand up. As he stood up, he started speaking. Okay? He didn't do the speaking bit. Could you imagine? It's, actually, he, he wasn't messing around. As he stood up, he began to address the crowds. He stood up and says, fellow Israelites and you Gentiles. Okay? This is, this is a groundbreaking beginning of a speech. Because actually in the synagogue, the only people who were ever spoken to were the Israelites, the Jewish believers, the Gentiles, the, the, the God-believing Gentiles, I have to qualify that, or God-fearing you might find in some of your translations, they, they were spoken to. Normally they were ignored because they were at the back. Hello to you at the back. Okay? This message is for you. Particularly for you at the back, hiding away. Uh, to avoid the spit zone. Um, to, to avoid being picked on because you're too close to the front. No, they were being spoken to directly on this occasion. And, and, and Paul really is very keen to actually have them hear him. Listen to me. I mean, he was already invited to speak. So therefore, people are going to do him the justice of listening. But actually, it was fellow Israelites and you Gentiles. Listen to me. I want your attention. This is important. Grab hold of this. And so, Paul addresses them too. And... Um, have you ever been somewhere, perhaps, where uh, you, you found that uh, you were being spoken to directly, even though you weren't expecting it? I mean, some people say this about sermons. They actually think that uh, the preacher has got some inside knowledge on the various uh, issues or sins of, uh, in people's lives. And there, and there was, oh, you know, I think that, uh, that someone must have told them about me. The thing is, though, there'll be other people in the room who'll be hearing a message about something else that God might be speaking to them about. And so there's this event where God, by his Holy Spirit, is interacting with the preacher and interacting by the preacher to the crowd, but also there's the story which runs before that where people are bringing their own experience, their own understanding of God, and something is going on. Yeah? And it's, it's not straightforward, it's a little bit messy, but God is actually speaking on different levels to different people all at the same time. Does anyone think that God can't cope with the complex, different issues that everyone in the room faces today? Does anyone think that actually God is too busy, or 
my issues aren't important enough that he would be speaking to me today. If we had time, I would have to name everybody's name here and say, this message is for you today. First, uh, there's a few application points. I'm not sure if I'll get through them all today, but uh, we'll try our best. Opportunities um, don't just happen, um, they're planned. Opportunities that, um, sorry, I've put the wrong thing up. Opportunities to speak the word of God need to be planned. Paul was not invited to go to the synagogue and his companions. Paul went to the synagogue with his companions and their whole plan was to go and to sit there in the place where the believers were gathered. These were Jewish believers. And Paul was waiting for an opportunity to be invited to speak. He wanted to speak to the people of Israel. And uh, he wanted to make sure that they heard the message about Jesus. But he couldn't just go in there and start talking about Jesus. He had to get the opportunity. He had to be welcomed into that community before he was allowed a voice. So he went in and sat down. Because he wasn't about to be just chucked out. If you're part of a sporting team, um, whatever sport you would care to mention, the plan normally is um, it's to, to find a way by which you've got an opportunity to score, to kick a goal, to, to land a try, to uh, score points, and to try to outmaneuver your opposition so that you're able to score in order to win. Yeah, that's why you play sport. And this is exactly what Paul is doing here. Text says that he went into the synagogue and sat down. He would never have had a chance to score any points in this community unless he went in to be part of it, to be accepted into it, and to be given the opportunity. No opportunity outside, but he wanted to make sure the people of Israel, the believers, got a chance, but also, as we know, the God-fearers. He put himself in a position where he could proclaim the gospel to an audience of interested listeners. Think about the level of uh, efforts that Paul had made just to get to this point. Travelled hundreds of miles by foot, by boat, and uh, gone across mountainous terrain uh, to get to Antioch. And... uh, It took planning, it took effort, it took prayer, it took sacrifice, it took money out of his own pocket, and it took a willing heart just to get to this place. Some planning. And you and I don't normally do things that we don't plan, do we? I mean, we we may be uh, inspirational characters, we do things off the cuff, but I bet none of you go on holiday without planning to go. Does anyone plan to go on holiday without planning? No, we plan. We make a plan. Uh, We make sure we have everything with us so that we uh, arrive with all the things that we need. We make sure we've got our passports, our visas and stuff like that. We make sure we've got it all. Does anyone um, not plan on a birthday party? Apart from the surprise ones, which are done for you. Someone else has planned it. There's always a plan. Uh, retirement could be another issue, there, but um, you understand the points. In order to make an impact, in order to score a point, in order that the gospel could be proclaimed, Paul planned this moment to get to this platform, if you like. And next week we'll be um, hearing from Ian and Andrea about... Um, Uh, who are our link missionaries from the Baptist Missionary Society, about how they use media, how they plan to share the gospel with people who are Arabic-speaking. 
It takes a lot of planning, particularly when you think there's a particular dialect that they're trying to communicate with. You've got to get it in the local dialect. Useless having an Englishman trying to speak Arabic words, you need somebody who can speak that language as native. But not only created opportunities, uh, not only creating opportunities is important, but actually seizing the opportunity. How many of us, and you, uh, I'm just guessing probably all of us, because I have to hold my hands up to this, how many of us have realised there was an opportunity at some point during the week or during the year where we could have shared about our hope in Jesus Christ and we didn't take the opportunity? We didn't seize the, seize the moment. Paul not only created the moment, but he seized it. And, but what do you do when you seize it? You capture it and you start to share Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them the gospel. Um, what is the gospel? In this text, Paul specifically calls it good news. It is good news. It's the greatest news in the universe and the good news is it's about Jesus, okay? About how God can save us through Jesus. Now, it's possible that Paul modelled his sharing of Jesus after Stephen, the guy who was stoned to death a few chapters earlier. If you'll remember, Stephen... Um, it's, it's, well, actually, I think I remember saying then that Stephen very likely would have presented the gospel to Paul when he was still called Saul. He may well have debated the scriptures with him, but of course Saul was all about persecuting him at that point, and he knew the, uh, the depth of knowledge and the passion which Stephen had, which eventually led to his death. And Saul stood there holding the coats of those who cast the stones on him. And now, here, perhaps years later, Saul shares Jesus, and he does so in some very similar ways to which Stephen did before the Sanhedrin. Now, that's homework again. If you've not read those chapters from Acts chapter 7 uh, we're looking at there, um, go back and have a look. But Paul takes the people in the synagogue here, in Antioch, and gives them a history refresher course. How many of us love history? Not many? Okay, good, yeah. Uh, I heard a quote the other day, which I don't believe to be true, that uh, people who love history tend to not, not like mathematics, but uh, Richard's raised his hand, and Rebecca. You didn't, know. So, yeah, the, the mathematicians don't like history and the historians don't like maths but uh, I don't think it's a general rule um, anyway um, that's just an aside um, so we've got this uh, this moment and uh, here we go um, they would have quoted the Shema again and um, but what what Paul does which is quite brilliant he begins his talk with this crowd from a point of agreement He's gone into the Jewish synagogue. So all things Jewish are going to score very, very highly. Saul being um, the, uh, under the tutelage of Gamaliel, the, uh, this rabbi of, of great history and, uh, and fame, Saul begins, or Paul begins his speech with them. And uh, here it goes. He said, the, the God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. And for about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. And he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. He's not said anything dangerous yet, has he? Not to the Jewish audience. They'd have probably thought, oh, yeah. The history, oh, yes. And, and, he, and all, you can almost imagine them agreeing this. You know, Who chose our fathers? God did. Who made them um, great during their stay in, in Egypt? God did. 
Uh, who led them out with an uplifted hand? God did. You can imagine them just agreeing with every word that Paul was saying. Who put up with them for 40 years, moaning in the wilderness? God did. And who destroyed the seven nations uh, before them and gave them a land as an inheritance? God did. Oh, you can imagine that they're just loving everything Paul's saying. We love hearing the history of our people. We love hearing how God has always taken care of us. God's always on our side. You see, he's winning them over. Paul presents God as the one who has presided over and directed and performed all that has happened in Israel's history. And as we go through this text, you'll notice that Paul continues to build his case that God is performing all these things. Make no mistake about it. History is his story, capital letters. It's God's story, and, it's, and he is directing the play. He's the captain of the ship sailing on the sea of time. And I have no doubt, as Paul is recounting their history, they're nodding their heads in agreement. They're saying, Amen. Amen. Oh, yes, Amen. Paul then presents them their first two kings. Uh, they asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish. He made David their king uh, after removing Saul. And God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. God gave them a king that they wanted, and Israel realised, OK, this isn't the type of king that's talking about Saul. So God gave them a king he wanted, he wanted, and that was a man after God's own hearts. And he brings David to the forefront. He reminds them of a promise. David was a man that said, God, I want to build you a dwelling place. I want to build you a house. And God came back and said, David, I'm not going to let you build me a house. But I'm going to build you a house from your seed and from your descendants. I'm going to establish your house. I'm going to establish your throne forever. It's going to be an eternal position, an eternal person. You may want to build me a house, but I'm going to build you a sure house. See, God, he's actually saying to the people here, actually, uh, you wanted a king, and God gave you a king that you wanted, but then God gave them a king that he wanted, a man after his own heart, and since this man was after his own heart, he wanted to build God a temple. And God said, actually, yes, I'm going to build a temple upon which you will reign forever, but actually, not you. Not you. You're not going to build it. So why did Paul begin with uh, this point of agreement? I believe it's because he had a destination in mind with his speech. That leads to the next point. All history culminates uh, with Jesus. He uses David, this huge point of agreement, to plant the seed which culminates with Jesus. And he said... Uh, in, in verse 23, from this man's descendants, from David, God has brought to Israel the Saviour, Jesus, as he promised. Oh, this is the turning point. Everything else to this point they've agreed with, and they've agreed with the fact that God wants to put someone on his throne forever. And they'd have all thought, actually, that's supposed to be David's. And he gets to this point, let me tell you about Jesus. Paul begins to tell them all about the greatness of Jesus Christ. God has brought him forward, the offspring of David. Oh, it gets interesting. The Christ, just as he promised. Let me ask you some questions. Do you believe there's a divine plan behind all of history? 
Is God orchestrating all that happens to accomplish his purposes? Does this world really make sense to you? If you're a believer today in Jesus, you understand that God is sovereign and that he is orchestrating all the events on planet Earth up to the coming of Jesus. But God's sovereignty in the world's history does not stop at Jesus' first coming. God is still orchestrating all the events in history which are leading up to Christ's return, his second coming, when he will return to this planet and he will rule and reign forever. That is where history is going. There's a point in history when Jesus will return. All roads point to not Rome. All roads point to Jesus. This is where our planet is heading. It's not going to get there haphazardly, randomly. It's going there under the direction and the sovereignty of God. Here's another question. What if history leads to nothing? That's the world's argument, isn't it? What if history leads to nothing? What if Jesus isn't the one? I throw these questions out, sir. Comfortably in church because this is what you'll face in the world. The obvious uh, conclusion that Paul came to as a result of questions like this is in 1 Corinthians 15. And you may well have heard it quote, quoted quite well by, by others. It's where it says, Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If that's all there is to life, then we might as well just get on with. Uh, Stuff which doesn't look too great, actually. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. It's a, to live a life of complete and utter debauchery and self-indulgence. Eat and drink, party, and live a decadent, full-on, hedonistic life if that's all there is. If we approach life as if there's no divine plan, as if there's no point in all of this, then we'll find a point. And do you know what the point of life will be if that's the case? Me. I. The only point of life if we reject Jesus Christ is it's all about me. It's all about I. I will do what I please. I will eat and I will drink. I will do what I want to do. I will not care what anyone else thinks. I will just do my own thing. But what Paul says is that all history does lead to a destination and that that destination revolves around the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He is the connecting point that brings it all together. He brings order to our chaos. He brings clarity to our confusion. All of history culminates in Jesus. Now, there's never a great place to stop in the middle of uh, a wonderful message like this. But I want to, uh, to leave you hanging here. Um, uh, to, to look, looking at uh, where we've got to in this, in this particular speech that Paul makes. Because uh, we, we can't... Uh, do justice to this text without uh, uh, giving it a bit more work. So uh, I invite you back for two weeks' time when I shall complete this, which I shall do, uh, an update. But let me just say this, um, and I want to make this invitation for us all, okay? If we have agreed that God is in charge and that God has a plan, okay, and I've I've kind of thrown away this idea that actually, um, well, if, if God's not God and Jesus isn't who God, uh, God sent, and he's not the Messiah, then we might as well all eat, eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Or we could uh, lead a very sort of uh, uh, isolated spiritual existence, uh, which meant that we didn't have to do too much about it. I'm inviting you on a journey which would actually mean that we take Jesus and his words, that we change our lives, and live for him, and make a real difference in the world. Because that's what's happened. 
And that is what is happening because people's lives are being transformed. Amen? To which all the crowd go, Amen. Yes, of course they do. I want to invite you on that journey. So not uh, have this attitude, well, it's, it, this is going to happen anyway. No, look for what God is doing in his generation, in this generation. Look for what God is saying to us and look for, since we know the story, if, 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 all, if, if it's all going to lead to Jesus, everything's going to culminate with Jesus, then actually, let's see the signs. Let's, let's journey on with God. Let's not give up, be fatalistic, but to look to what God is doing because God has sent great and many witnesses to declare his word to us. And that's what we'll find when we continue in this, this story, the, the witnesses that uh, are now called to the stand. So we are, um, we've got to this stage now where we've got a kind of courtroom setting and um, Paul is becoming the, the king's counsel and he's going to bring his evidence and he's going to bring evidence which the, the barrister on the other side has already agreed to. Okay? Because the barrister for the Jewish people is going to say, yes, God, God's this, God's got a plan, God's going to set somebody on uh, David's throne forever and he's talking, Paul, about Jesus. It just needs to be revealed. So, let's be still and ask God for ourselves. Lord, we, we're halfway through, and yet we can see that everything here is pointing towards Jesus. Everything here is pointing towards God's plan for the world by which we can be saved. Saved, Lord, from ourselves, saved from being fatalistic, saved from being self-centred and saved in order to be those who would live lives that are very full to the glory of God. Living lives which uh, are not solely aimed at living in eternity with you but being of vital significance in this generation in our lives. So Lord God, we come before you now and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Son of God, as Lord of all, who comes to take away my sin, to clean me up, so that I might live for you and experience every moment of every day the presence of your Spirit, that we might bring glory to you in this generation. In the name of Jesus. Amen.